I'm Margaret Brennan in Washington, and this week on Face the Nation, crisis averted as Congress passes a short-term funding extension to keep the government open. We'll speak exclusively this Sunday morning with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. In a dramatic 11th hour scramble on Capitol Hill, lawmakers voted to extend government funding at current levels for 45 days. The bill passed with overwhelmingly bipartisan support. But did House Speaker Kevin McCarthy alienate the GOP hardliners who refused to vote for it? We'll ask him. What's missing in the bill? Any help to deal with the border crisis? And there's no aid to Ukraine, which the Biden administration says will run out before the November 17th deadline. We'll talk to South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham and Trump administration Defense Secretary Mark Esper. What's included in the bill? $16 billion in disaster relief. That type of funding will help with once unthinkable scenes like the New York flooding. The state's governor, Kathy Hochul, will join us. Bipartisanship saved the day, this time around on Capitol Hill. Can it happen again? We'll talk to the heads of the self-proclaimed House Problem Solvers Caucus, New Jersey Democrat Josh Gottheimer, and Pennsylvania Republican Brian Fitzpatrick. Finally, a tribute to trailblazing California Senator Dianne Feinstein, who died last week at the age of 90. And the nation's longest living president celebrates his 99th. It's all just ahead on Face the Nation. Good morning and welcome to Face the Nation. Congress has done it once again. They've kicked the proverbial can down the road, passing a 45-day funding bill to keep the government running. Now, the deadline for getting spending bills passed is November 17th. Joining us this morning, the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. Good morning. You've had a heck of a week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there is a lot to get to with you. I want to start, though, on the news this morning from Congressman Matt Gates, who says he's going to uh, seek a motion to vacate. He's going to try to oust you as Speaker of the House. Well, that, that's nothing new. He's tried to do that from the moment I ran for the office. Look. Well, this time he says he's going to keep going. May not get there before the 15th ballot, but it took 15 for Kevin McCarthy. He okay. says he's coming for you. Can you survive? Yes, I'll survive. You know, this is personal with Matt. Matt voted against the most conservative ability to um, protect our border, secure our border. He's more interested in securing TV interviews than doing something. He wanted to push us into a shutdown, even threatening his own district with all the military people there who would not be paid, only because he wants to take this motion. So be it, bring it on, let's get over with it, and let's start governing. If he's upset because he tried to push us in a shutdown and I made sure government didn't shut down, then let's have that fight. You need 218 votes to vacate. Has Hakeem Jeffries, the Democratic leader, said that he will? No. He hasn't no said what? He hasn't said anything about what he's going to do. Look, Look will he, Democrat, Democrats could cross over and follow Gates' uh, lead on this. Yeah, he, he, look, Gates is trying to work with Democrats. He's reached out to Swalwell, to AOC, and others. But if that's the way we're going to govern, I don't think America is going to be successful. Look, at the end of the day, think of everything we've been able to accomplish so far. Parents' Bill of Rights. We passed the most conservative bill to protect our border, make America energy independent. We've been able to cut $2 trillion in the debt ceiling, get work requirements back in. The hard part we have right now is yeah. the Senate has not passed one appropriation bill. Each body is supposed to pass 12. We've passed more than 70% of the discretionary spending already. But those I thought have it was no appropriate. Of surviving in the Senate and making it into law. Well, you said and that, we you said that same thing when we, when we stopped the D.C. from decriminalizing everything. You said the same thing when we said we we're going to stop the pandemic. I don't think pandemic. I ever talked about those things. Well, no, to be uh, you with and you. The, maybe but, the press would do think, why pass it? Because the Senate won't take it up and won't sign it. Most of the, in the press probably thought we would have shut down yesterday, too. But no, we did, did not. You, were you confident we wouldn't shut down? I was confident I could get something on the floor to make sure the option that we would not. But that you weren't our sure military. It was pass. Well, well, I wasn't sure it was going to pass. You want to know why? 
because the Democrats tried to do everything they can not to let it pass. They did Democrats dilatory. were the ones who voted did you, for this did you in a did larger you watch number it? than Republicans to, to keep the continuing resolution alive. Did you watch Nine, the floor yesterday? Oh, yes. Okay, 90 the, the, Republicans voted against it. One okay, so Democrat let's, wa let's walk through it. what actually happened. First of all, the Democrats stood up and did dilatory actions, asked to adjourn. So was that supporting mm -hmm. to adjourn? Then they used the magic minute. They went as far as pulling the fire alarm, not to try to get the bill to come up. Look, That's Democrats Jamal stick together, Goldman. but they did not want the bill. They did not, they, they were willing to let government shut down for our military not to be paid. No, I wasn't. We are gonna mm -hmm. make sure we keep it open while we finish the job we're supposed to do. You got 45 days. That's right. So Well, technically 47, but. <laughs> okay. Senator Cornyn said of you last night, you pulled a rabbit out of the hat a couple of times. I mean, he's acknowledging this was tough. Uh, are we going to be staring down another shutdown? November well, it all 17th. comes to the Senate. The Senate hasn't done one thing. But in the House, are we going to be f facing another shutdown November 17th? No, because the House is doing their work. We've already done more than 70% of it. So compare this to the Senate. The Senate hasn't passed one bill. The Senate didn't pass anything about the shutdown. The Senate hasn't passed anything about securing the border. The Senate hasn't passed anything about the $100 a barrel. The House hasn't passed anything about the border that could actually become yes, law. Yes, we have. No. Not that could become law. Be that's your opinion. The House is its own body. The Senate is its own body. We're not going to surrender to the Senate. We pass what the American people want. Mm -hmm. I will tell you each and every day, and don't take my word for it, you're going to have the governor of New York on it who yep. told people to go somewhere else. The New York City mayor literally says will it's destroying a, a city. No, let me Are answer, you let me answer your question since you said we wouldn't do something. Do you know the governor of Massachusetts has declared a state of emergency? This is one of the number one crises as far Absolutely. from the board as you can see. This is killing Americans every single day. There was no border funding day. in the continuing resolution that passed last night, but let me ask well, you no, about no, But Ukraine. that's not fair to just say that. Let's understand. Well, there wasn't. Okay, well, let's, <laughs> let, let, let's educate the viewers why there wasn't. Because the day before, there was. But Matt Gates and others yeah. de denied that and voted no. So we could have had border security. Okay. I went all the way through everything we could yeah. to the last moment. And you know what? We're going to okay. be able to win that. When will you be able to bring a vote on Ukraine aid. The White House says that you have, are going to do this quickly. Look, the priority for me is America and our borders. Now, I support um, being able to make sure Ukraine has the weapons that they need, mm -hmm. but I firmly support the border first. So we've got to find a way that we can do this together. What do you mean the border first? Because the White House briefed Congress that 45 days, they don't have enough money they have more than They have more than three, they have more than three billion dollars right now mm -hmm. to be able to help them get through it. If they have some challenge, we can sit down and we can talk about that. But the American border matters. And more people, more Americans are dying on our border than Americans are dying in Ukraine. So you are explicitly right now linking any Ukraine aid vote to a border bill. It won't I be a standalone Ukraine. I'm telling you that the American border matters, and that is our priority to make sure we secure that. So that has to I'm move first. I'm going to make sure that the weapons are provided for Ukraine, but they're not going to get some big package if the a border is not secure. But you haven't figured out yet the vehicle through which to move that Ukraine aid or a date by which to do it. We will work with or people border. in need, but the one thing the White House has to understand, they better be prepared to secure American border. What it does matters. that mean specifically? What are you looking for there? Well. The, the bill you think that won't go anywhere could easily do it, HR2. Remain in Mexico, finish the wall. Uh, you've got to change asylum to be able to secure this border. That is the bill, the border bill that you want passed. And yes. you are now, not it sounds like attaching not that it to I, Not that I want it passed. It is passed, and the Senate has done nothing. So let's see where the You just Senate said you go. wanted border first. So you're not talking about holding a new vote in the House on the border. I'm trying to clarify what you're okay, talking so, about here. So, okay, not, not to be, but how it works is the House passes a bill, the Senate passes a bill, and you go to conference. The House has already done their job. Yes. The Senate, and we've done this in a probes. The Senate has done nothing. So what I am saying is when you saw government funding, there is a need for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I support being able to provide the weapons to Ukraine, yep. but America comes first. Okay, so you're not sequencing the bills or wasn't, weren't meaning to suggest that in yes. your comments earlier, right? Yes. Okay, wanna make sure I understood that. Um, how much harder did your job get when Donald Trump came out and said that Republicans should shut down if they don't get everything they need? 
And, well, and are you going to endorse him explicitly? Look, I think I think President Trump's going to be our nominee and President Trump's going to win because President Trump's policies made America stronger. We didn't have inflation. We had a secure border. Are you endorsing we did, him We now? didn't have a $100 barrel oil. Um, so what I totally find is the president is going to be our nominee. The president is going to win re-election President Trump for the basis that we want to make America stronger. And the other thing, too, is look what's happening in foreign policy today. You've got five American embassies that had to be evacuated. You've got this new axis of power growing against. You've got uh, a challenge when you, our own allies are now turning towards China. Mm -hmm. It's a lack of leadership, not just in foreign policy, within our border and everywhere else. This president has been in elected office for 50 years. Do you know he has spent more dinners with Hunter Biden's business associates I than he has visiting that. the border? Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't you think that's important then? One time in 50 years. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many people will die today from fentanyl coming across our border? It's a scourge. It's the equivalent of an airliner crashing every single day in America, mm -hmm. and they refuse to even visit it or do something about it. So we are going to make sure this border becomes secure. We will watch for what that means legislatively. Speaker, thank you very much thank for you. your time today. The rainfall in New York these past few days shattered records, with the most rain ever recorded in one day in some places. Once unimaginable, these kinds of scenes are becoming more common and the need for disaster aid more urgent. New York Governor Kathy Hochul joins us from Albany. Good morning, Governor. Good morning. You called this life-threatening rainfall event. The subways were shut, part of LaGuardia Airport shut down due to flooding. I mean, it, this is stunning. Do you have an assessment of the level of damage? Well, that's exactly what we're doing right now, Margaret, is asking the local counties and the boroughs that were affected to add up the amount of money. It has to hit a certain threshold in order to be eligible for FEMA reimbursement. And that's another whole topic about how with these all too frequent 100 year storms and indeed we had a 1000 year storm event just a couple of months ago. Uh, we need to reassess how we reimburse states and homeowners after these cataclysmic weather events. And so we're doing the assessment right now that'll take place over the next couple of weeks. But uh, we got through the worst, but in my position, having issued nine weather related emergency declarations in the two years I've been governor, we have to be ready for this to happen again, even in another week from now. So that is that is the new world we're in. Well, uh, late last night, Congress did reauthorize the National Flood Insurance Program. That was in question uh, for a bit. Um, what federal aid are you expecting to need here? Well, we need help to help build up our resiliency, help the business owners that had to shut down, help reimburse localities for the overtime and the extra resources they had to expend with emergency teams on the ground. We had 28 rescues from our swift water rescue teams and all that should be reimbursable from the federal government. So we have our list, but again, for the Republicans in Congress to even toy with the fact and hold over our heads there might not be flood insurance or disaster assistance up until the final hour, that's unconscionable. And it's tone deaf to what states like New York and many others are going through in this new area of, era of climate change where the unknown is becoming the, the norm here. But, but given this concern about fiscal spending, I do want to ask you, you know, NASA had a report out a few days ago saying parts of New York City are sinking from both human and natural factors, and that can impact flooding risk. So if, if that's true, you have to rebuild a whole lot of infrastructure, and taxpayers did pump in billions to that national effort. Is there enough in the federal infrastructure plans here to do what you need to do? Well, we're not the only vulnerable part of our country. Look at low-lying areas of Florida and other states that are just being pummeled with hurricanes. And uh, so, no, all of our states are going to need some level of greater assistance. And for, again, Congress to even question whether they'll do the basics for us and hold, our, hold us hostage, wondering if we're going to be able to get this essential relief for our homeowners and our businesses, uh, that's just wrong. So yes, we need a full assessment of communities like New York City. One of our challenges in New York City and why the flooding is so, uh, you know, so devastating and floods into our subways and, and homes is that the New York City sewer system was built over 100 years ago with a capacity of one and three quarters inches per hour. 
We shattered that record just a couple of days ago. We had double that, so the volume of water needs a place to go, so we need massive infrastructure dollars, and I thank yeah. President Biden for helping send money to states like New York to help us build up that resiliency, but it's gonna be a long process. In the meantime, we're always having to prepare for the next disaster. It's stunning that a trillion dollars is not is not sufficient um, nationally. I, I want to ask you as well about the other crisis you've been raising alarms about, and that is um, the strain due to migrants. Um, there were no border provisions in this congressional bill that just passed, and I know you've said you've had to manage without help from Washington. What would you ask Congress to get done in the next 45 days? Well, shame on Speaker McCarthy and the Republicans in Congress, including the nine from New York State who are complaining like crazy about the migrants, but refuse to work with President Biden and come up with a sensible border strategy. It can be done. This can be done in a bipartisan way, comprehensive immigration reform. Where what specifically quotas, do you want? Numbers people can commit. Well, we want them to have a limit on who can come across the border. It is too open right now. Uh, people coming from all over the world are finding their way through, simply saying they need asylum. And the majority of them seem to be ending up in the streets of New York. And that is a real problem for New York City. 125,000 newly arrived individuals. And we are being taxed. Now, we are always so proud of the fact that New York has the Statue of Liberty in our harbor. harbor. We, we are mm -hmm. one of the most diverse places on earth because of our welcoming nature and our it's in our DNA to welcome immigrants. But there has to be some limits in place and Congress has to put more controls at the border and not in this budget threat, shutdown right. threat. Talk about eliminating positions for border patrol when we actually need to double or quadruple those numbers. So get back to work and do your jobs. Governor, good luck. Face the Nation. We'll be back in one minute. Stay with us. We're back now with South Carolina Republican Senator Lindsey Graham. Uh, good to have you Thank here you. in good person, morning. Senator. You just voted for a short-term deal that doesn't include a cent yeah. for Ukraine yeah. nor for the U.S. border. Right. How did you swallow that? We had to keep the government open. We got 45 days to fix both problems. Uh, I, I listened to Kevin closely. Uh, there will come out of the Senate soon a bill that will have three legs to it. Disaster funding, we need more, not less. Uh, robust funding for Ukraine to get them through the next fighting season, not $24 billion, And a major effort to secure our border. I believe there's bipartisan support in the Senate to do both. And it will go to the House hopefully in the next 30 days. What the speaker was talking about, though, was a bill, H.R. 2, regarding the border that Senate Democrats will never get on board. There will so be what a are you talking about? Right. So we got to fix asylum. We need border security agent increases. We need more detention beds. I think there's Democratic support for major border security reform, but we have to attach it to Ukraine. To those who say we need to fix our border, you're right. To those who say we need to help Ukraine, you're right. To those who say we need to do the border, not Ukraine, you're wrong. The vast majority of Senate Republicans would support a combination of border security, Ukraine funding, and disaster aid. Mm -hmm. Well, when it comes to the House yeah. <laughs> and the, the idea that we got to move swiftly, right? Right. The White House told Republican leadership that they don't have enough funding for Ukraine to make it through 45 days, and the authorities they have are insufficient. Yeah. Well, so how much time are you talking about needing? You know, I've been around a while I'm wearing a pen. Do you think I would leave Ukraine? Hang I don't believe that one bit. This same White House says we don't need F-16s, we don't need high Mars, we don't need tanks. I've lost confidence in their evaluation of what's going on in Ukraine. We've got a bunch of allies. They can help for six weeks. The allies have spent more money in Ukraine than we have, and when you hear otherwise, it's just not true. It's been good burden sharing, but I'm not worried about the next six weeks. I'm worried about next year. We will produce in the United States Senate Ukraine funding 60 or 70 billion, not 24, to get them through next year. We will have a border security measure that is strong, and we will have additional disaster aid because the nation needs it. We're going to do those three things, and I'm hoping our House colleagues will react positively to it. I think Kevin is the right guy at the right time. The only way he loses his job is if a handful of Republicans join up with the Democratic Party to fire him. That would be a disaster for They're the future of the Republican Party. That's not going to happen. Kevin has the 
overwhelming confidence of his membership. He worked to avoid a shutdown. Mm -hmm. He will help Ukraine, but he's telling everybody in the country, including yeah. me, you better send something over for the border for me to help Ukraine, and he's right to make that demand. Understand, but you're look, you're talking about, to be clear, a supplemental bigger than $24 billion for Ukraine, and that's going to pass bigger. in 45 days. Oh, absolutely. You know okay. why? Because we need it. We haven't I, lost one soldier in the Ukraine. We yeah. spent less than 5% of our military budget. 50% of the Russian army has been destroyed by the Ukrainians. They would be at Crimea already if, it, if the administration had been so slow right. in giving weapons. Well, and, and we dedicate a lot of time to Ukraine on this program, um, okay. so we find it important. But I want to ask you, because uh, Leader McConnell had gone into the lunch yesterday telling Senate <clears throat> leaders that he believed the White House when they said they were running out of funding for Ukraine, and then his deputies apparently urged him to drop it, which is how you ended up with this bill with nothing in it. For well, Ukraine. He, he, is he in control of the caucus? Uh, of the Senator caucus? McConnell's been great in Ukraine, but he picked a formula to lose votes for Ukraine. To expect people like me and others to vote for Ukraine aid without border security is unreasonable. Mitch made a miscalculation. He's been great on Ukraine. I told him a thousand times the key to Ukraine funding is to deal with a broken border. 107,000 Americans have died from fentanyl poisoning, mm -hmm. from fentanyl coming across the southern border. We haven't lost one soldier in Ukraine. So uh, America is being invaded from a broken southern border. To my Democratic colleagues, you need to take border security seriously. Yeah. Are you saying that Ukraine should not be a standalone? It has to be. A it will not be a standalone. Not. When I go to South Carolina, I openly talk about helping Ukraine. If you let what? Putin get away with this, you have a bigger war. Well, what about our border? I promised people in South Carolina, I'm going to do two things. Mm -hmm. I'm going to help secure our border and keep the fight going in Ukraine to make sure that Putin doesn't get away with this. Have you asked uh, Donald Trump, your friend, to come out and publicly support more aid to Ukraine and to push some of these skeptical members of the Republican conference? I'll leave it up to him to what to do, but he wanted to get out of Afghanistan. Well, Vladimir Putin has been praising him for yeah, his comments well, about Russia. Ukraine. Here's what I'll Ukraine. say about President Trump. He did not pull the plug on Afghanistan, even though he wanted to. The biggest mistake we've made since the war on terror is withdrawing from Afghanistan. To President Trump and anybody else, if we pull the plug on Ukraine, that's 10 times worse than Afghanistan. There goes Taiwan. To stop funding Ukraine is a death sentence for Taiwan. Putin will keep going. You missed all of World War II, if you don't know how this uh, mm -hmm. movie ends. To the Republicans who say Ukraine doesn't matter to us, you're wrong. Respectfully, you're wrong. The war gets bigger, not smaller. There goes Taiwan. If Ukraine can beat Russia, China's less likely to invade Taiwan, and Putin gets stopped. I need to take a break here, but we have more to talk about back. with you, Senator. Um, <laughs> you will. Uh, Senator Graham's going to stay with us, and we're going to talk about the legacy as well of Senator Dianne Feinstein on the other side of that break. We'll be right back. If you're looking for political news that goes beyond the headlines, be sure to tune in weekdays to our CBS News streaming politics broadcast, America Decides, Monday through Thursday, 5, 6, and 9 p.m. on CBS and Paramount Plus apps and on CBSNews.com. We'll be right back. We'll be right, we'll be right back with a lot more Face the Nation, including a look at the legacy of Dianne Feinstein. Former Defense Secretary Mark Esper will be with us, and we'll talk to the congressional problem solvers. Stay with us. Welcome back to Face the Nation. We turn now to the life and the legacy of California Senator Dianne Feinstein, who died late last week. Women are seen as spear throwers of change. It, it, we're not the same thing repeating itself. Then Senate candidate Dianne Feinstein first appeared on Face the Nation in 1992. Ms. Feinstein, uh, is, uh, is gender a plus or a minus for you? There's so many men back there, and we don't see anything happening. The Californian was a pioneer, winning her seat in the year of the woman. The Senate went from two female lawmakers to six. Feinstein said it was the first time she felt her gender wasn't a negative for voters. When she was elected to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors in 1969, there weren't many women in public office. Feinstein became the first female mayor of the city following the assassination of two of her colleagues. Both Mayor Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk have been shot and killed. 
She never forgot that experience and championed gun laws, including the 1994 assault weapons ban when she reached the Senate. I am quite familiar with firearms. I became mayor as a product of assassination. I'm aware of I that. I found my assassinated colleague and put a finger through a bullet hole. Though it expired 10 years later, her passionate campaign continued. Let me talk about rights for a minute. Does a child have a right to be safe in school? Does a law client, when it goes, he goes into a law firm, have a right to believe he's safe? Does a shopper in a mall have a right to believe that she's safe? I think so. That position put her at odds with conservatives. But she became a deal-making centrist, an increasingly rare breed in Washington, and at times challenged her own party. This is not what Americans do. As the first woman to head the powerful Intelligence Committee, she sparred with the CIA director and accused the agency of trying to cover up its past abuse of terror suspects. We're supposed to be better than that, that we don't have to torture people. America, she argued, is big enough to admit when it is wrong and should be confident enough to learn from its mistakes. Being a pioneer wasn't easy, as she told Bob Schieffer in 2009. We women have had to fight for everything we've gotten in the public arena. We weren't given the right to vote. We had to fight for it. Today, women make up a quarter of the Senate, following a path she helped to forge. Senator Graham uh, was one of the Republicans, as you saw there in that piece, who worked with Senator Feinstein actually quite closely yeah. on the Judiciary Committee. Loved her. She was great. When I first got to the Senate, somebody told me, now I'll protect their, their name here, if you want to get anything done, see if you can get Ted Kennedy and or Dianne Feinstein to help you. Because if they got on your bill or your idea, the people in the Democratic caucus would listen. If Ted was the lion, she was the lioness. She could move votes. She knew how to get to yes on controversial things. She was always kind. She was always prepared. She was a defense hawk. Uh, she was socially liberal. She was my friend. I miss her. And if you're looking for a role model in politics as a young man or woman, look to her life. You know, there is also that image of her embracing you after yeah. that very contentious hearing, yeah. Supreme Court Justice uh, yeah. Amy Coney Barrett, and she was criticized from within yeah. her own party for yeah. praising how you conducted yourself. Uh, how do you think about that now? Well, that says more about the current state of affairs than Diane. Diane was saying nice things. Um, we had a, like a five-second hug, and because she wanted to say something nice about me, they thought she had to be off the committee. That's what's wrong with Paul. Diane wasn't the problem. She was the solution. And there are people on my side. It, it goes both ways. So let, let's just do this. Let's reflect on a well-lived life. America's better for Diane Feinstein having served our country. California's better for it. And we lost a lot. We just didn't lose a person. We lost an idea. And I want to re... My contribution is to try to re, reinvigorate the idea it's okay to be tough and kind. It's okay to be liberal or conservative, but it's even more okay to work for America. And that's what she did. We've lost a lot with Diane. So the rest of us, we're going to have to up our game. Before I let you go, I want to quickly ask you, she was also an outspoken proponent of abortion access, right? She was. Are you going to reintroduce your bill, limiting it to 15 weeks of access, which has kind of become a litmus test for a lot yeah. of these presidential candidates? Yeah, Donald I will. Trump has not signed on. He said he, he didn't like 15 <clears throat> weeks. My bill has exceptions for rape, incest, life of the mother. 47 or 50 European nation, of 50 European nations limit abortions from 12 to 15 weeks. 15 weeks, the baby can suck its thumb and feel pain. I will introduce that bill. I want America to be like the civilized world, not China or North Korea. It's a debate worthy of a great country to have this debate, and we will have it. Senator Graham, thank you for your thank time. You. We'll be back in a moment. We turn now to the former Secretary of Defense under President Trump and author of a sacred oath, Mark Esper. Uh, good to have you back with us today. Um, you know, Morning, we, are, we are having conversations about just how politically difficult basic matters of governance are in Washington. Um, and I wonder what sign you think that sends to our adversaries around the world. Well, thank you, Martha, uh, Margaret, for having me on this morning. First, let me also salute uh, Dianne Feinstein, as we mourn her passing, she was a real leader in the Senate. You know, at times she would buck her party. She could reach across the aisle. She was a real leader 
uh, from my time on Capitol Hill, and uh, we're going to miss her, and we need more people like her. So, uh, again, my condolences and my salute out to her. Uh, look, on your question with regard to what our allies see, Vladimir Putin sits in Russia today, and he looks across the landscape, and he sees the United States of America, which is uh, unwilling to spend what it needs to on defense. It is now pulling back spending for Ukraine. We've seen successive Republican votes where more and more Republicans vote against funding for Ukraine. Uh, he sees uh, coups in Africa. They're pushing Western militaries out. He has a pro-sympathetic uh, uh, or sympathetic uh, Serbia that's massing troops on the border of Kosovo. We had a vote today in Slovakia, a NATO ally in Central Europe that just picked a prime minister who is pro-Russian uh, and has promised to cut spending for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Look, from his vantage point, the West is fracturing, and he's going to continue to wait out the clock and maybe hope that Donald Trump re returns to the presidency. I wanted to ask you specifically about that, because in your book you write extensively about your frustration with uh, getting then-President Trump to support aid to Ukraine, and that was before the full-scale invasion, that was when Russian troops were just in the east of that country. Um, he still, to this day, is not coming out in support of aid to Ukraine. And as we just talked about, Vladimir Putin has said some of the comments he's made make him happy. Uh, what does that mean in terms of what we should expect in, if there is a second Trump presidency? Well, I suspect that he will do what he says, and that is he will come to office, he will somehow attempt to negotiate a deal between Russia and Ukraine, and, and that won't fly. There's only one person that can get uh, end this conflict in Ukraine, and that's Vladimir Putin, and he's not about to do that anytime soon. So I suspect Trump will quickly move to end funding for Ukraine, and then at some point he's also going to move to um, withdraw funding for NATO and maybe even pull out of NATO, which would be disastrous for United States national security. So for all those reasons, uh, that concerns me. And then, of course, we could talk about our allies and partners in Asia as well, who will equally be concerned yep. about these type of events. So, I mean, you're clear you're not supporting uh, the former president's bid to return to office, but, you know, the governor of Florida, also a presidential candidate, has has raised his personal objections to, you know, um, limitless checks as well. So do you like any of the Republican candidates right now? Well, first, let me say there should not be any blank checks for Ukraine, right? And and every all of everything we provide should be audited and accounted for. That's just good as government. It is. But, but look, on the, on the bigger question, uh, look, I'm disappointed in, in, in some of my party who are not picking up that, uh, the mantle of Ronald Reagan. I, I consider myself a Reagan Republican. Ronald Reagan uh, would definitely support these young, fledgling democracies, whether it's Ukraine in uh, Europe, which is being invaded by its larger, bigger dictatorial neighbor, or Taiwan. In, uh, in Asia that's being intimidated and threatened by China. Mm -hmm. That's what Ronald Reagan stands for. I, I, look, I think there, that said, I think there are a few Republicans in the debates right now who I could support, um, who are better certainly than Trump, and who could beat President Biden. And I think for Republicans, we gotta quickly find that person, rally around them, and then who? bring the party together and run a strong candidate. You wanna give me a name? <laughs> uh, look, I, I think we've seen some good performances from Chris Christie, Nikki Haley, uh, DeSantis, mm -hmm. Tim Scott, I, I think there are three or four or five, but the, the Republican voters need to decide who that is. It's not Donald yeah. Trump, uh, but I, I think there are a number of good candidates out there. Um, I mean, you've made clear you see President Trump as a threat to democracy, not just a, a flawed candidate, a threat to democracy, you've said. Um, upon his retirement last week, General Mark Milley, uh, an ally of yours during your time in office, appeared to refer to him in his farewell speech as a wannabe dictator. Is that overstating things, a dictatorship? Well, look, if you go back the week prior, um, Donald Trump uh, said that Milley, for his behavior, whatever he thought that was, uh, was, was uh, sh should, should be punished. And he, he talked about execution, so, which was completely un unfair. Mark Milley served this country honorably for 40 plus years in war and peace, moved, uh, dragged his family around 20 plus times. He deserves our respect and admiration and not that type of talk. Uh, no less coming from the commander in chief, the former commander in chief. So, so look, I, I have a lot of concerns about Donald Trump. I have said that he's a threat to democracy. I think the last year, certainly the last few months of Donald Trump's presidency uh, will, will look like the first few months of the next one if that were to occur. There are a number of stalled military promotions in the Senate, you know, talking about problems with democracy right now. Um, 
Are you disappointed that even in Congress, Republican leadership hasn't been able to, to clear that hurdle and get the caucus in line to say that, you know, some of the highest ranking military officers in our country should get the jobs that they've been nominated for? Yeah, look, I'm concerned on a few levels. Look, first of all, I think uh, Senator Tuberville's serious in, uh, about his concerns over the policy issues. He's had a chance to bring him up for a vote and declined to do that. And I, I think it's unfair to hold military nominees, over 300 now, uh, hostage, if you will, uh, over a policy issue for which that's not their responsibility. That's a civilian responsibility. And so uh, my view is that they, that should not happen. It's happened in the past by both parties. And I've called on recently Senator Schumer to start moving nominations, which he has, because otherwise it looks like both parties are politicizing the military. That's my institutional concern. And then, Margaret, if you step back, you ask yourself, mm -hmm. look, the Chinese government doesn't shut down. The Chinese government doesn't do continuing resolutions. And they certainly <laughs> don't hold up their admirals and generals. Uh, when they need them as they prepare for potential conflict with the United States. We just look really dysfunctional and we're harming our own readiness in the process when we look across the international environment. Mark Esper, thank you for your analysis today. We'll be right back. We're joined now by the co-chairs of the Problem Solvers Caucus, Pennsylvania Republican Brian Fitzpatrick and New Jersey Democrat Josh Gottheimer. Good to have you both with us. And we got a lot of problems that <laughs> you do need to solve. Um, I want to start on what we just learned in the course of this program, which was Speaker McCarthy coming out and seeming to link some movement on the border to his willingness to move a Ukraine funding bill. Then you heard Lindsey Graham say how that would go down, or he wants it to go down in the Senate. He called it a three-legged stool. Would you get on board with what Graham proposed? I would. Um, I think we have a lot of uh, challenges. I think we need to address all of them. Uh, it's actually consistent with the problem solver framework that we introduced last week. Uh, it addressed keep our government open, it addressed Ukraine, it addressed our border. Uh, and expiring authorities. Uh, we dealt with several of them in the continuing resolution that passed, thankfully, yesterday. Uh, but there are remaining items that are unaddressed, the border and Ukraine being two of them. But the border proposal that has passed, the HR2 that Speaker McCarthy talked about, would not go anywhere in the Democratic Senate. That's not going anywhere. I mean, but I, but I think, to Brian's point, we have to address both. And I think it's a false choice to say we're going to do one or the other. Right. Like, clearly, we know that we've, we can make it the next 45 days to support Ukraine, make sure we stand up to Putin and to China and Iran, which is critical to our national security and to our allies. But also, we need to make sure that we deal with and, and deal with the challenges uh, at the border and border security and live up to our values there. Right. What Graham laid out, though, was not just funding for Ukraine. It was... I mean, almost a year's worth of funding for Ukraine. Can you get that done in 45 days? Well, I think we can't. We know that we can get through the next 45 days, but it's a matter of days and weeks and uh, not months and years in terms of what we have available to make sure that we, Ukraine has what they need to stand up to Putin in his dictatorial march. So I think we have to make sure that we get some legislation to the floor quickly. I know the, the speaker is open to that. He signaled that he's open to that. I think that's key. And, uh, but we also, we have other challenges and we can do more than one thing at once. And I do think the Ukraine funding should be for a longer period of time. It should be for a year. It sends the right message to Ukraine, sends the right message to Russia. Um, and it's, it's perhaps, I think, the best uh, solution inside our chamber to get that done. Um, and the border security language, just you know, in our framework was mm -hmm. a bipartisan bill. Uh, it was Kirsten Sinema and Tom Tillis's bill in the Senate. Myself, Jared Golden in the House is a two-party solution to the border. Uh, it's, it represents the intersection of where the two parties agree. And you think you can get the speaker on board to consider I'm going to work hard. Yep. Um, you also <clears throat> heard today the call, a motion to vacate, to oust Speaker McCarthy from leadership. Uh, he says he can survive. Can he? Yes. Uh, to me, this, the, what, what's going to be put on the floor is a, a choice. Are we going to reward bipartisan bills being put on the floor, or are we going to punish them? That is a choice. Uh, sub substitute out Kevin McCarthy's name for Hakeem Jeffries or anyone else. Mm -hmm. If the situation were reversed and, and the squad tried to do the same to um, uh, Hakeem Jeffries, should he be speaker at some point, I can tell you what I would do on the first and 100th vote. I would vote to table it. Uh, because I don't think that sends the right message. I think, I think what we need to do is encourage bipartisanship, encourage two-party solutions to be brought to the floor. Mm -hmm. That's what we need. Um, and to do the opposite would really be rewarding this Hatfield versus McCoy 
brand of, brand of politics that's destroying our nation. Ga Gates says he's going to keep coming, and he can, right? He <clears> only, <throat> yeah. only one vote needed for a motion to vacate. And that may require a change in the rules package. I mean, this cannot be the, tra the trajectory for the remainder of the Congress. To We've, stop one person from correct. being able to. Correct. I mean, that was, so keep in mind. That, that was the, how Speaker McCarthy got to the leadership. That was one of the promises that he was, made. That was, well, that was one of the changes that was made, but we were given assurances that that was never going to be used, that it was a matter of principle that it be remained at one. So um, you can't have it both ways. And I can, 90% plus of the American public does not want us to be voting on a motion to vacate every day for yeah. the rest of the term. Is he going to get Democrats? Sounds like Brian was hoping to Hakeem there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but are Democrats going to join Gates? You know, he I, needs to get 218 I, votes. The way I look at this, you've got a civil war raging in the Republican caucus, and, and as it has been since the beginning, right, with mm -hmm. extremists trying to take out common sense. And they keep doing it time and again. And so I'll leave that to Brian. You know, that's their caucus. And I'm from Jersey. We don't mess with other people's families. And so I'll leave it to them. But, but I'll tell you what we're very open to from a policy front. We continue to do this. As you mm -hmm. saw yesterday, as you saw the debt ceiling, when if there's bipartisan ideas brought to the table, we're always going to be at that table negotiating in good faith. That's what the Problems Harvest Caucus does. It's how we got yesterday done, right? If you remember, that's how yesterday happened. You had every Democrat plus one help cover for the 91 Republicans they lost. We all came together for the good of the country to stop a government shutdown and make sure we help people and help families. That's the kind of stuff we should be sitting at a table about negotiating good faith, and we'll continue to do that. Republicans have shown they can't govern on their own. Fair? Well, I've, I've seen the only way these things are getting done is with Democrats, yeah. right? And so, in bipartisan governing. And that's good for the country. The co people want us to put the country over party. So, can you say we won't be back in the same place November 17th talking about a possible government shutdown? <clears throat> well, we're two out of 435. So, we're not in a position to make that prediction. What we can say, like we said last Sunday uh, on a show that Josh and I appeared together, we will do whatever it takes to keep the government open. Uh, we made that pledge. We were prepared to take drastic action yesterday. Uh, had that not passed the floor. What do you mean? We will do, well, there are a number of mechanisms where we could force a floor vote on our two-party solution. Okay. There are options for us to do it. We were Addition. prepared to do it. Sure. Thankfully, that's one of many. Okay. Um, thankfully, we didn't have to go there, but we will do what it, what it takes to make, make sure the lights are on in the United States government, for we're sure. Gonna work around, I think the point is we're going to work around the clock these next 45 days. But this cycle of insanity has to stop. And that's what Brian and I believe, right? We need long-term solutions. We can't keep doing this and wasting our time. We have yeah. real challenges in the country. And this includes the right. debt ceiling as well. And, this, and we cannot be constantly on the, on the, on the 11th uh, hour of That's why we were behind that. that deal. It's not even know? the debt ceiling. The FAA is going to be authorized. Exactly. You haven't right. passed a, into law a defense bill. Yep. These are the most but basic things. the extremists, things. you saw how yep. we got here. These ultra-right-wing extremists keep fighting against reasonableness and common sense. They refuse to vi vote for uh, the debt for the uh, defense bill, right? Multiple times they kept trying to take it down. Yep. And that's the point. That's why you need bipartisan solutions right now in this Congress. It's the only way we're going to be able to govern. The extremists are the problem in this country. It's the bipartisan moderates that are the solution. That's what we believe in. And you have a proposal to get all of 100%. this done. 100%. In we, 45 we've introduced, days. We introduced our bill last Friday. Yeah. It's, a, it's the only bipartisan bill. It's equal. Uh, Co-sponsors, Democrat, Republican, represents where the intersection of the United States of America is. And that's what our country wants. They want us to approach government the same way we approach our personal relationships. But, th but then you heard, I mean, as we were talking about with, with Senator Graham, I mean, I asked him about Donald Trump. He, he still won't come out and support <clears throat> Ukraine aid. You have other presidential candidates wavering. He on called that for the well. government to shut down. <clears throat> so, <laughs> President uh, Trump. Yes. Right. So if people are governing by popularity polls and not by the mandate that you say you feel you have, how do you solve that? I mean, the, these. I can tell you the overwhelming majority of Congress. I can tell you the overwhelming majority of Americans support the approach that Josh and I take. You approach government the same way you approach your personal relationships. You don't allow the perfect to be the enemy of the good. You take 80% of something rather than 100% of nothing. You come to the center, you build consensus, and you move forward. That's how all of us operate our lives. Mm -hmm. It's this loud, noisy fringe, the Hatfield versus McCoy saber rattlers, yeah. that get all the attention, but that's not where most of the American people are. That's why Josh get attacked from the left and the right. Do you every think day. Speaker McCarthy learned the lesson that you 100%? And I think, yes, I mean, yesterday was Exhibit A, and I hope, I hope that's a breaking point. We have a five seat majority, that's all they have. The only way we're going to get stuff done for the country is by us working together. Yep. That's the only way, as we're seeing. All right. Gentlemen, thank you. Thanks that, for us. We'll be back in a moment. There's a big birthday celebration in Georgia this weekend for our 39th president. Mark Strassman has the details. Happy birthday to you. They're celebrating a birthday in Tiny Plains, Georgia. Grab a cupcake. Yeah. Jimmy Carter's birthplace 99 years ago today. Get down there and hang out as a family. You know, just be a, a really small private event. Um, 
he, he can't party like he used to uh, for his 99th birthday. So None of us can. <laughs> right, none of us can. That's exactly right. I love you, Jimmy Carter. Happy birthday. I Americans celebrate with him. Amen. The famous... And happy birthday, President Carter. And the everyday... A Jimmy Carter Happy peanut birthday, gallery Carter. of well-wishers. The White House wooden cake, 39 candles for the 39th president. It's some salute, considering most Americans alive today were born after Jimmy Carter left the White House in 1981 and moved back here to Plains. He's like the father of the town. He's the heart of the town. And we just celebrate him every day. When Carter entered hospice back in February, his family thought he had days to live. Seven months later, he's earned all this birthday fuss. He's modest, and um, but, you know, he smiles, he, he likes the attention. He's proud of it. He's very proud of it. Jimmy and Rosalind Carter, now married 77 years, will celebrate the day as true Southerners with family, fried chicken, and caramel cake. His favorite. They've gotten to experience this outpouring of support over these last several months that has really been gratifying. And we also want to wish President Carter a happy birthday from all of us here at Face the Nation. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.